Greetings, this is Bill Brieger. I'm a professor in the health systems program at the Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, prior to that, I worked for 20 some years at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria, which is where I got up close and personal with uh, malaria and the mosquitoes that carry it. So a lot of my experiences go into the courses I teach about malaria. During this lecture, we'll have an overview of the preventive measures that hopefully will lead to the elimination of the disease. Uh, we'll look at some of the challenges to that elimination. Some of the things that have been expanded uh, since uh, efforts to roll back malaria started are expanding chemo prevention, uh, new malaria vaccines, the challenge of urban malaria and new vectors coming into Africa. The existing interventions we have, there are challenges of insecticide resistance, climate change affects both people and the parasite and the mosquitoes. And we have financial challenges as we do with many public health programs. But with the road ahead, we will look at what hopefully is possible uh, in the years to come leading up to the 2030 goal of eliminating malaria. Uh, much of the information from this presentation comes from the World Health Organization's 2023 World Malaria Report. And I've put a link on the slides so you can download that report and read it for yourself. I won't go into the details of this life cycle of the disease that is on the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention website, but note that the malaria parasites, uh, and there are four or five that affect human beings, uh, go through various stages of development once they enter the person from a, an infected mosquito bite. And at a stage, more mosquitoes will bite and then the parasite continues to develop in the mosquito, getting ready then to spread back to other human beings. The burden of malaria has been with us for centuries. Uh, at present, we suspect that it has an annual uh, effect of nearly 250 million cases. And this occurs in 85 malaria endemic countries throughout the world. Africa accounts for the vast majority of these cases. And although 2030 has been suggested as a target for eliminating malaria, incidence of cases has remained stable. And we've had challenges to our health system to uh, deliver uh, interventions because of epidemics like COVID-19 and because of financial challenges uh, in the in many countries. Fortunately, there are some new preventive information uh, interventions and we think these will offer hope to reach our goals. So far, malaria prevention has been based on two broad approaches, controlling the mosquitoes, the vectors, the, keeping people from being bitten. Uh, the insecticide-treated bed nets are a major feature, and now we've uh, improved those with using dual insecticides instead of just the original version of having one insecticide-treated net. There's also continued use of the indoor residual spray of insecticide on the walls of homes where that is possible. We have been using medicines to prevent malaria parasites for quite a number of years. Uh, preventive interventions um, are known for preventing in pregnancy called intermittent preventive treatment. Women get that once a month from the second trimester onward. Uh, using at present the sulfadox and pyrimethamine so they can have this for as many months as possible up until delivery again after the uh, start of the second trimester. There's also been a monthly program to 
uh, troll malaria through chemo prevention using the sulfadoxin pyrimethamine and the amodiaquin in treatment doses again. And this is in the Sahel region of Africa at present and uh, monthly doses during the high transmission season are provided through community health workers. We'll talk a bit more about that. These interventions that have been underway uh, for 20 years uh, have been making some progress, but there are challenges of delivery and coverage. Uh, Again, the ITNs are the primary, the insecticide treated nets are the primary vector control used in most countries. And manufacturers over the period between uh, 2004 and 2022 supplied more, nearly 3 billion nets globally. Uh, and two and a half billion of those have been going to Sub-Saharan Africa, as mentioned, the place where the uh, bulk of malaria cases occur. Uh, 35 countries have adopted the intermittent preventive treatment during pregnancy, and these are countries that have uh, year-round uh, transmission of malaria. And so the coverage has increased, uh, but it's still below the target of 80%. Uh, Originally, the recommendation was for two doses during pregnancy, uh, but when there was uh, notice that the sulfadox and pyrimethamine was less effective, it was recommended to be monthly, as I mentioned earlier, be, uh, starting at the second trimester. So the goal is at least three doses during pregnancy. And so we have not achieved the target of 80% in these countries that have adopted it. So there's still, there's improvement, but there's still need for work. It's estimated that uh, 42% of pregnant women in these areas have benefited from three doses. Um, and that's up from 34% in 2001 and only 1% in, in uh, 2010. A major global challenge though that will affect these successes um, happens to be climate change. And this is the cover of the World Malaria Report. And as you can see with the thermometer there that uh, the implication is that uh, climate temperature changes uh, are serious and they're a serious threat to malaria. Uh, it affects where the mosquitoes can breed uh, it affects the parasite. It affects human population movement. Uh, other challenges that hamper progress in malaria control and many public health programs are, of course, conflict and humanitarian crises that continue uh, throughout the world, resource constraints that make it difficult for people to donate to uh, organizations like the Global Fund uh, that provides assistance to countries for HIV, malaria, and TB control. And then there are biological challenges such as uh, parasite resistance to the drugs and uh, mosquito resistance to the insecticides used in nets and uh, in um, the IRS, the indoor residual spray. So these are discussed in more detail in the World Malaria Report. But basically what we're hoping to do is move from prevention to elimination. Uh, this issue of elimination is a country by country process wherein no local transmission will occur. And the possibility of certifying your country as malaria free means that there are no reported cases that are locally transmitted in a three year period. Eradication of any disease only occurs when all endemic countries have eliminated that disease. So that's a big challenge. As we said, there are over 85 endemic countries in the world at present. So according to WHO, 25 countries were uh, that were malaria endemic in the year 2000 achieved the three consecutive years of zero indigenous um, 
malaria. So far, 15 of these have been certified. They have to check to make sure that this is accurate. Uh, one of the things, though, is even after you're certified, you still have to prevent imported malaria from neighboring countries. Another piece of good news is that two malaria vaccines are now available. In 2021, after many years of research, the uh, WHO recommended the RTSS vaccine for children living in uh, regions with moderate to high rates of Plasmodium falciparum malaria, which is the common uh, species in Africa. Over 30 years of research went into this uh, vaccine. Uh, collaboration among the producers, GlaxoSmithKline, Walter Reed Army in, uh, Research Institute, the National Institute of Health in the U.S. Um, this is a circumsporozoite uh, protein antigen, and it was identified as a target in the immune response by uh, radiation attenuated sporozoites. So several years of implementation research. So it wasn't just the basic research to the usual clinical trials, but uh, three countries were involved in, in trying to integrate the delivery of this vaccination uh, to children uh, in the uh, one to two year age group. Uh, and to see how this could be integrated with the regular immunization programs in these countries, working out the details, because it's one thing to say it's efficacious, it's another thing to say it can actually get delivered. And the trials for the implementation part were very successful. Ideally, a dosage uh, of three to four contacts in the early years of life is recommended. And we'll mention the challenges of adherence to any vaccine is uh, also facing this one. Uh, uh, the name uh, Moscurix saves lives. Uh, this is uh, um, in Science Magazine shared that uh, WHO uh, reported that the vaccine cut deaths among children by 13% over nearly four years of the pilot program. Uh, and so now it is available. It's being, uh, the distribution is being uh, coordinated through the Global Vaccine Alliance, Gabby. But uh, in addition to preventing child deaths, it also reduced severe malaria. And so this is the key factor that we, you know, are looking forward to as the vaccine becomes part of the malaria toolkit. So distribution uh, after WHO approved the, the vaccine is continuing in those three original countries, uh, Malawi, Kenya, uh, and Ghana. And now uh, other countries have been applying for and receiving supplies with the help of Gavi and other uh, partners like UNICEF. A second vaccine has been uh, developed uh, as this one was going along too. And this is called the R21 vaccine. It's also been found to be safe and recommended and uh, by WHO. It's a novel vaccine that uh, is available. The first supplies have been uh, sent out to a couple countries. Uh, more are applying. And the idea of having two vaccines available is very important for addressing supply chain issues because demand for these vaccines outpaces the supply. Just like any other immunization program, efforts to uh, provide the two new malaria vaccines will experience some constraints, but of course there are benefits to these new vaccines. As in any immunization program, adherence is always a challenge, especially if people need to get more than one dose. Uh, people will have challenges remembering uh, 
when they should go or if they should go for the vaccine. The other thing is vaccine hesitancy. There may be people who are reluctant to get this particular vaccine or any vaccine. They may be concerned about side effects. And so health education is necessary to overcome any of these uh, problems that we have in terms of adherence. Uh, together, the two new vaccines, the RTSS and the R1, reduce uncomplicated malaria by at least 40%. They reduce severe malaria of convulsions, severe anemia by 30%, and all cause mortality in children by 13%, according to the US CDC. And the link to CDC and more information is provided here on the slide. So we want to thank you for listening to this first section of our uh, technical updates, and please join us for the second section uh, that's coming up. Thank you.